Jacqueline, for your work on The Revenant, whose costume did you work on first? Uh, Leo's, <laughs> definitely. And what was the, the reason, be, because you felt to center it? I think it was important to figure out his character and what he would wear and to tell the story of his character, especially for Alejandro. He's the pivotal point of the story, of course. It's the story of Hugh Glass. And I felt that if I had his look established and the feeling for it and the emotion of that costume, that that costume would evoke, it would kind of uh, determine the people around him because I felt he was a quite a different character than the other trappers for the most part he wasn't a trapper he trapped for food and survival but he was looking for something much different out in the wilderness than the other trappers he it was more of a, a spiritual quest for him he had lived with the Native Americans he communed with the animals it was a um, kind of commonality between Leo and and nature uh, that he and the animals were in it together surviving in this very very uh, extreme environment and they used each other or fought each other or did whatever and I felt that all had to be embodied in his costume and I knew he was the most important character spiritually for Alejandro who's a metaphorical director so early on I showed Alejandro two pictures one was an Arikara hunter not a not a, a warrior a hunter in a long knee-length fur leather coat with a hood and he was very monk like and Alejandro really responded to that it was and then I showed him a Russian icon of a Russian monk in the early 1800s and Leo's costume started evolving from those two pictures do you remember when he first tried on the the coat the, this monk like very uh, well uh -huh. Alejandro was there in the room and I had my cutter fitter, Rosalie Lee, who's brilliant, um, in the room. And he put it on and he just, he already had his beard. And he put it on and he looked like a mystic almost. And I knew Alejandro would respond. I had three versions, but there was one version. When I took a picture of him, he was almost Jesus-like. It looked like a Russian icon, his eyes, just lit up the room and all this beard and the fur of the hood and the leather and I I saw Leo's whole body language uh, changing he went from modern to mountain man <laughs> in about five minutes it was amazing it was an amazing transformation and when we took fitting pictures of him in that room and the light was coming in it was uh, we were in Calgary and the light off the Rockies was it was all one side of the room was glass and it was just shining in on him and it was like he was in this like a uh, beam of light like from heaven and he just lit up I mean it was quite an amazing moment I'll never forget it so how did that one costume impact the rest of the work for the Revenant well, I thought it was important for him to look like uh, a guide, uh, somebody who hunted to keep the men alive, and uh, a leader. So Leo has power and stature just by his size. He's tall, he's got great big broad shoulders, but he also, I felt, shouldn't look like uh, quite the mercenary as I made Tom Hardy costume to uh, reflect it, he Tom Hardy was there not just for survival but for monetary gain he was in the wilderness for completely different reasons than um, Hugh Glass so 
I wanted his coat to look a little bit more designed. I used fringe to wick the water. It was totally lined in pelts. His hat, his, at the beginning of the movie, he wore, wears uh, a piece called an eye patch to cover his scar because it was historical that when anyone was scalped that was a more seasoned fur trader, they were told to cover their scars so that the young, it wouldn't scare the young recruits to the fur trade off. So it gave him an almost kind of pirate, sinister look at the beginning. Later on, I added more and more badger. As he goes towards the fort, he's got a full on uh, badger down his back, uh, otter down his back and badgers on the front. And I figured those two animals have totally figured out the wilderness and survival and uh, they're very wily and smart and um, there was a certain, because uh, he's not a, a either a black or white character, he's so there in the gray, he's doing, he's a victim of his own desire to survive and it goes awry and it's unintentional for some part and the other part is just mean but I wanted that survival of the fittest in his incorporated into his coat and then Bridger was young Jim Bridger how it was reflected in his wardrobe he's in the movie a lot he was became having been trained by Hugh Glass about the wilderness, he became the most famous mountain man of all times. There's a fort erected to him in Montana. Jim Bridger became the definitive mountain man in America. And probably he's the most famous. He's the one all the reenactment people emulate. So I made his coat buffalo to represent the Great Plains. And having been trained about the Great Plains by Hugh Glass. I lined it. It's uh, it's it's a real buffalo skin turned inside out because I thought that showed, you know, a certain smartness wearing the fur on the inside. Um, and that was that was the theory behind him. And then um, Captain Henry, I tried to keep out of fur as much as I could and keep his military bearing intact. And fortunately, I kind of. Uh, pounced on the Museum of the Fur Trade, which this lovely woman, Gail Potter, who I've known for several years, runs and curates, and she helped me a lot. She had a lot of actual pieces under glass of Henry's clothing with drawings other men had done of Captain Henry. So she had his actual leggings, leather leggings there at the Museum of the Fur Trade in Chadron, Nebraska, and she let me copy them and they're under glass, they're from 1823. Is the way you begin a film the same for every project or does each one have its own specific course of research? Um, hmm, that's a good, that's a good question. Basically, basically the same. I start by really just immersing myself in the period. I read novels written in the period, I read journals, I read letters, I read, and if it's a historical character like Hugh Glass, who was close to my heart because we have a ranch in South Dakota about a hundred miles from the mouth of the Grand River where this bear tack took place. And as we've traveled through South Dakota with our horses to ride in different areas, we passed the mile markers. Hugh Glass spent his 40th night crawling to Fort Kiowa here. This is where Hugh Glass climbed into a horse. This is where, it, you know, he's this historic icon. Uh, he's one of, he's also one of the famous mountain men. And in South Dakota, there's statues erected to him and mile markers. And so I read every biography I could find about Hugh Glass. Um, I started reading fur trapping journals. Um, Gail Potter at the Museum of the Fur Trade gave me um, some fabulous books, like 40, Jack Fisk gave me 40 Years of Fur Trapper. Uh, she gave me the historic history of the textiles and furs and, and wools of the fur trade. And I just read everything. Um, 
then I look at pictures, like Live by Night, which I'm working on right now with Ben Affleck, is a totally different process because the 20s was so, and the 30s are so photographed by some of my favorite, favorite photographers. So that was a different process. This film, The Revenant, was much more based on paintings, drawings, um, and accounts, uh, a lot of diaries, journals, uh, written accounts. And when, you, when I did all that on this, on The Revenant, then it had to all be filtered through Alejandro's vision. And as I said, he's very metaphorical. And so it, he didn't care so much about me being a stickler for the exact history or the exact. He wanted each costume to create an emotion. And I can tell if I've hit it or not with Alejandro by his body language. He responds so viscerally to things that he, you, you need to create a mood that tells the philosophy of that character, where he came from, where he's going, what his philo own personal philosophy is and how it's changed because of what's happened to him. His, the environment he's been living in, the men he's been surrounded with, the animals he's had to kill, the Indians he's had to kill. And all of that has to be incorporated into a costume for Alejandro, for him to love it. And then the aging became something that was the most important to him and to Chivo. And that was something, I had a brilliant ager on this film that came up with a solution to it because I had read and, and told Alejandro that when these trappers got off the boats in, in Missouri, their clothes were so greasy, no one could tell what they were made of. Were they wool? Were they leather? Were they fur? And so we came up with a greasing process that the reason they used bear grease and animal grease to coat all their clothes and get that really dirty aged patina was to keep them dry. It waterproofed them. There was no, there weren't, there was no bell staff or barber or North Face or Patagonia then. So keeping warm was part of the whole science of being a fur trapper. And I had to make sure that was incorporated into their wardrobe for the reality, because they spent so much time in below zero temperatures and in the water, freezing water. And I understand you do a backstory, maybe, on of each every character. Mm -hmm. I do. I create, you know, and I, of course, ran, would run these backstories by Alejandro when I'd send him pictures late of not at night when he was done you know, pre-shooting and rehearsing and everything is our communication would go on very, very late. I do drawings and send them actually p pictures of prototypes. I'd even dress people in the costumes, age them, and then talk to him about the backstory. And on this movie, it had a lot to, I had to create backstories because they couldn't all be cookie cutter trappers. He would never be able to have lived with that. That he hates anything that's cliche or, you know, Daniel Boone-esque or Davy Crockett-esque, you know, fur and coonskin caps were not going to make it into this film. And so it became quite a, an, a process. It was, I can only say it was a process. I'd create a backstory. If there was anything, I read about all the men on the actual Ashley expedition and uh, I just pulled, made up kind of different tales for each of these men, like what part of the, uh, what part of the country they came from, what their economic status was, uh, would they have, how long had they been in the wilderness by their age, how much of their European wardrobe would have been copied by Native women and turned into uh, actual uh, leather and fur clothing. Um, to what extent is the changeover? How much wool did they both still have? And that was a big part of the process. Now, I understand you started out as a designer in Berkeley. When you first began, um, you know, going into film, 
How ambitious were you to have that as your full-time career, or was it just one project that led to the next? I wasn't at all. In fact, I was a fashion designer, and I had a, a successful company with my own department in Barney's in New York, and a very uh, close friend of mine um, was a filmmaker and asked me if I would come and design uh, the movie Henry and June, and it was Phil Kaufman who did The Right Stuff, Unbearable Lightness of Being, and um, he couldn't get me in the union, and I was opening a new store in San Francisco, and I was, my business was really, you know, very big at that time, and I I said I couldn't, and I was in Paris showing my line at the Pret-a-Porter, and I get a call uh, at my hotel that night from his o Phil Kaufman's office in San Francisco asking if I would get in touch with him, and uh, I called his hotel. Actually, he was living on the Place de Vosges in Paris, and I went and had dinner with him and his wife, and he said, will you come and work on this with me? And I said, well, he said, we'll fly you back and forth to Berkeley. And I said, sure, because he'd been to my house. Um, I wanted to introduce him to Joaquin Nin, Ani East Nin's brother, who taught at Berkeley, and I knew before their movie started. And he'd been to dinner at my house and said he wanted Ani East Nin's house to look like my house, and he hadn't gotten that from the French, you know, production design department. Would I come and work on the movie and design her house? for him. And so my first credit was overall artistic consultant to the director and on Henry and June. And I started buying things wildly at the Marche Malik in Paris for him and even clothes for the closets and stuff, which the actresses even ended up wearing. And so I wouldn't let him pay me for that. And so the very next movie, because <laughs> he was my friend, and I stayed maybe a month in Paris working on it, and then I went home and continued to send him drawings of her house and colors for the rooms and everything. And the next movie he did, he said, I want you to design it. And between Phil and Sean Connery, they got me in the union. And, that, and I was only going to work for him, ever. And the second movie I did with him, I was nominated, which was Quills, and I started getting all these calls from agents and other directors. And I gradually segued from fashion into this business. I started doing more movies, and, you know, creating my line fewer times a year until I finally just left that business and ended up here. And came from the Bay Area to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I didn't for a long time. Okay. I worked from there for a very long time. How much detail do you pay toward background players? You know, the some most. Oh, the most. Interesting. The most. Because I feel that so much attention, anybody can get the three or four lead characters right. Because you spend so much time on them. And, and I feel that it's the background that, and the, the background, the cars, the horses, or whatever, carriages, that really sell the period. It's that big background out there, if it looks really, really real, then you have your, you have the setting, the, the whole backdrop for the painting that you're going to do your main portraits within. And I always say that the background is the most important part of the movie to me, getting it right. Like all the natives in this movie, all the background French trappers, all the f trappers that don't have speaking roles in the movie that are um, stuntmen or, or just part of the camp or part of the entourage of trappers. I think that's what really, really sells the close-ups of your main cast. When you begin a production, how many times do you read the script? It, well, I go by the Edith Head rule seven times before you start. Don't even make one costume or do one drawing till you've read the script seven times. Because she said, then you know all your characters inside out, and you just take them shopping in the period. Interesting. And I, I understand that sometimes you'll have, it, correct me please if I'm, if I'm mistaken here, but a number of outfits, and you have that character walk in and kind of choose 
I, am I, am I, no, what, what no. I thought I, I'm, <laughs> forgive me, okay, we'll, we'll redo that one. <laughs> I don't know why I thought I had read that. Um, <clears throat> what eras do you find I like to choose. Oh, you like to choose, sell okay. sell them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, all right. I, for some reason, Brad, I, I that's thought. why Brad calls me a method costume designer. He said that I get right down into the very center. I peel all those layers of the onion away and dress actors from the inside out. And I try to do my homework to such an extent that I have a favorite costume going in that I've already shown to the director and usually have gotten, you know, a good response or you know, done my selling job there. And I give them choices, of course, because sometimes they've been working on the role a long time before they get to me often, especially really serious actors. And when they put something on that I am rather keen on, and uh, the director has liked when he's seen the pictures of the research, and they don't stand a certain way or get that right body language, I am the first one to throw it away. I have no ego investment in a costume, even when it's a kind of favorite of mine. If you don't, if it doesn't work on them, on their bodies, and you know, good actors, you know when you've hit the right costume because of their body language, it changes, totally changes. It's, I've always said that the costume is the bridge from the actor to the character. That's the first time they start really feeling that characters when they put on a costume. Can you give me some physical examples of the body language? I mean, do, they, do their palms open up? Are there well, one, my favorite of all times is Jeffrey Rush in Quills. And I'm going to back to one of my first movies, but it happens almost on every movie. But it was so extreme with Jeffrey when I put the Marquis de Sade, because he's very languid and loose and, and he's uh, fluid and, and, you know, I, not sloppy in his body movements, but very, you know, <laughs> uh, like his body has no bones in it. And when he put on the Marquis de Sade's costume, the white costume that he wears for 25 years in prison, his whole body language changed. He looked like an aristocrat from an ancien painting. And he started walking differently. And the actor that he is, he had me make one just for him to wear for the two weeks before he started shooting while he came to England just to rehearse. He wore it day and night. He'd come when we were shooting the Lunatic Asylum. It was, was to be Sherenton at, um, at Luton Hoo. He walked, would walk around the grounds, all the, all the very, you know, sculptured, palatial grounds of Luton Who in that costume. You'd see him out in the shadows, in the hedgerows and stuff, walking around in the Marquis de Sade's costume with the little stacked heels. And he, he would be so different than without it. Interesting. For a budding costume designer, you say read and go to museums. Why? Um, I just think I don't even think it's more museums, it's everything. Just expose yourself as much as you can to literature and to art. You know, watch every old movie that is considered like a film classic. Read all the Russians, read all the American, great American literature, read, you know, modern literature. Um, you know, if I'd say every young girl should read all the diaries of Anna Eastnin to learn about character and character studies. Read all of D.H. Lawrence. Look at all of every big photographer from the beginning of photography forward. You know, uh, it's your sentimental education. You owe it to yourself. And the more you, the smarter you are and the more you've learned and the more you've educated yourself and been educated by others, the better designer you'll be because you'll have much more to call on you'll have a better, you know, it's all about background knowledge, which is with the internet now, it's not considered as important, but it's what I've, I stressed to my daughter while she was growing up. She used to call me Miss Trivia, and I said, I said, and you have to be too. It's all about background knowledge. One costume that stayed in your mind forever from a film that 
it actually wasn't your design, but you never forgot it and you always sort of reference back to it. Hmm. Golly, I, I don't even know if I have one. Uh, my, it had to, I think it was um, Casanova, Fellini's Casanova. Uh, it was one of Casanova's costumes. And, and I actually emulated it for the Marquis de Sade in quills because I loved it so much. And it was uh, Donald Sutherland in a corset and a banyan. And what was it about that outfit that just really... It said started? everything about the character. The riches of the fabric and the banyan and the idea of a man wearing a corset being, you know, one of the great lovers of all times, and all the ambiguity that that costume created in that film. I never have forgotten it. 